So let's get started. My name is Shane Handy. I am the founder of The Rational Trader. We're going to talk today about artificial intelligence and the future of trading. But I have to tell you, the future is now. Okay. What we're going to do today is we're going to demystify artificial intelligence because it's really the wrong term. Uh, we're going to talk about what it is, how it works, and which you'll, you'll find fascinating, by the way. And it will, it will completely... Uh, demystify it for you and then we're gonna we're gonna look at a system that I've built that I live trade the markets with that use these techniques okay you are interacting with artificial intelligence as it's dubbed every single day uh, fraud detection uh, those ride hailing apps use it for things like uh, fare calculation and route calculation and uh, of particular interest is um, putting the driver on a route that has a likelihood of finding another fare for them. Uh, email filter, spam filter is one of the early uses of this kind of, this kind of technology. Uh, mobile check deposits, the, this technology is used to convert the handwritten text into something the computer can understand. Um, image recognition, what's in the image. Uh, you see this in uh, you know, like Facebook photo tagging. Uh, when you when you have your camera and, you, and it puts a box around the face, that's this technology at work. Uh, fa facial recognition, uh, initially something that we I always associated with things like security, and you know in airports and things like that. Now, it's on your iPhone, used for authentication. Uh, speech recognition. So Siri and Alexa are now uh, consumer devices, but even before that, we had. Uh, uh, like telephone response systems where you'd call and, and you know, you used, to, you used to say, you know, if you want billing, press one. If you want scheduling, press two. Now you can just say billing or scheduling or please just let me talk to a human. I'm begging you. Anybody. Um, a little artificial intelligence humor there. The problem is this is the wrong term to be using for what we for what these systems actually do. Okay, so let's talk about what artificial intelligence actually is. It's the goal, the research goal, of creating human-level intelligence in a machine. The goal. We have not achieved this goal. And in fact, I would argue we're not even close to it. Okay, the problem with this term is that it sets up assumptions in your mind that are incorrect. Okay, so it would be very similar to you deciding that you want to be a marathoner and you are gonna, you're going to run a marathon and you start researching how to do that and you start training and you buy shoes and you've, but you've never run more than a few miles in your life and now you're up to three miles and you're really proud of yourself and you call yourself a marathoner and your friends ask you, well, have you actually run a marathon? No, I haven't. Okay, well, how, how far have you run? Have you run 26 miles? No, I can, I'm up to three miles now. Okay, so why do you call yourself a marathoner? That's what this is like, okay? Artificial intelligence is a goal which we have not reached yet. And there's been a lot of very interesting work and a lot of uh, good tools have come out of it. Okay, but we, to, to, to call something artificial intelligence is to call yourself a marathoner when you've never run more than two miles, okay? Um, Artificial intelligence is not intelligent, as, as the term is used today. It's not even close to intelligent, okay? In fact, it's not intelligent by any definition of the word. A better term, a term for these systems that we're going to use today is machine learning. Machine learning has a very specific definition we'll get into in a moment. But in, in your daily life, and particularly after this, this uh, presentation, if you hear the term artificial intelligence, unless they're talking about th this research goal of creating human level intelligence in a machine, tr internally translate the term to machine learning. And today, you're going to learn exactly what machine learning is and how it works. Okay? A machine learning system is a system whose performance improves the more data that you give it. Okay, so let's parse that. I have a system, let's say an image recognition system. 
and I want it to tell me if I've got dogs or cats or giraffes or some whatever, whatever kind of animal in the image. If I give that system 100 images to learn from, it's going to do a lousy job. If I give it 1,000, it's going to do better. If I give it 10,000, it's going to do better. And if I give it a million, it's going to start doing really well. And in fact, today's machine learning systems for image recognition are now better than humans at recognizing images. They have a lower error rate than humans do. Um, an example, a good example of, a, of an excellent application of that kind of image recognition machine learning system is the analysis of x-rays. Radiologists take a lot of training and, and can only examine a few uh, per hour and do, and do it well enough. Machines can now do that uh, exceedingly well though they have to be trained specifically to do that. Uh, Stanford just did that research, very interesting. Uh, more, in, more importantly is the, the, the potential, because if you think about that, the machine can examine not just the x-rays in front of you that you've, you've given it for this patient, but it can examine the entire library and find commonalities that a human simply can't do. Okay, this, this is the power of machine learning. It's not traditionally programmed. It doesn't have if-then-else logic. Nothing, it, it, it doesn't have for loops and things like this where you, you know, if this condition, then that. It doesn't work like that. We're going to go over how it works. All right, and it, it, it is inspired by the way the human brain works, or rather how we thought the human brain worked back when this research was done, okay? Uh, an interesting question that's worth answering is, well, well, actually, uh, let's do this because we've got to talk about the elephant in the room. Um, will evil AI rise up and wipe out humanity? No. An emphatic no. In fact, um, worrying about this is a lot like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. Okay. These systems are not anywhere near intelligent enough to do anything other than exactly what we tell them to do. You'll see what I mean when we're done here. Uh, uh, worrying about this is a complete waste of your emotional energy, okay? Uh, a much more pressing issue related to AI in today's society would be the introduction of human biases into our machine learning systems. So for example, given that my machine learning system gets better the more data I give it, you have to be careful what data you give. If, you, if I give a machine learning system doing medical diagnostics only data from men, it's gonna have a, a gender bias in it. And we're, we're actually seeing this happen out in the wild, and so there's, act, there's actually active research going on on how to, how to deal with it, how to mitigate it. Um, what's happened recently so that we now have, sudden, suddenly it seems like there's all these systems that are, that are called AI with all these interesting capabilities. Um, there's three things in particular that have come together. The first is the most important, and it's just the basic computational power of the processors that we have available to us today. Okay, the, the AI research started back in the 50s, and a lot of the groundbreaking work that is the basis of what I've done here today, I'm gonna to show you later, was done in the 90s, but we just didn't have the, the computational power to do it. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of Moore's Law, which is a, um, it's really an instance of the law of accelerating returns, which, which talks about how human innovation and technology innovation increase not in a linear fashion, but more in an exponential fashion. And so that applies here, where once you, once you, when you're doubling your capability, pretty soon those doubles get really big, and it looks all of a sudden like there's a, there's a big jump. Uh, in particular, in this case, we also have something called GPUs, which are graphics processing units. Right? These, are, these are processors that were originally designed to drive the, the graphics on your monitors, in particular those, those fancy 3D video games. It turns out that the, those processors are very good at handling the enormous computational load that machine learning puts on them. Okay, uh, the second is some advances in software techniques, which I'll touch on a little bit later when it makes a little more sense. And then the third is equally important, and that's advances in our ability to, to process large amounts of data. It takes simply enormous amounts of data to train uh, 
a machine learning system. And we have not in the past had the ability to process that data, all right? We were in the past, we were limited to the amount of data you could fit on one computer. And in the past 10, really starting 10 years ago, we started to have the ability to process any amount of data by doing it in parallel across many machines. So uh, you can chain together now thousands of machines and, uh, with data on each of those machines and then run the, the processing of that data in parallel, no longer limited to just what you could fit into one box. Okay. Um, now let's get into how it works, which is another, another way of asking why is it useful. Let's say that I want to predict the price of a house. And so I have a bunch of data, and that data includes the sales price of the house. All right, these are the, the data is all of all the previous housing sales in the area. And I have the square footage of each house. And so I can plot this as you see on screen. I can plot the square footage on the y-axis and the sales price on the, on the x-axis. And then I can draw a line and get a pretty good idea that there is a correlation between square footage and sales price. And if I wanted to make a prediction on how much a house would sell for, then I would walk up the y-axis and then you know, travel across to the corresponding point on that line and say, that's my predicted price. Right? But you can see there's a lot of distance between those dots and that line. So there's, that's not necessarily a very good prediction, okay? So what if I wanted to get a better prediction and use another variable? Okay, if I wanted to do that, how would I plot that is kind of the first question. How would I visualize that? And the answer is something along these lines. I would add another dimension. So now I've got my square footage along the, the Z axis and I've, got the, I've added median income. So the median income of the purchaser is on my Y axis and the sales price is still on my x-axis. And so now I can go up to up the median income and, and, and down the square footage and then come across and find that point. And that's my prediction for my sales price for the house. What if I wanted to add another variable? How would I plot that? Think about that for a second. What if I wanted to add number of enclosed garages or number of rooms or size of the kitchen, size of the plot, geographic location, how about zip code? How would I plot that? And the answer is you can't. We as humans, we just immediately break down as soon as we, as soon as we cross the three-dimensional threshold, okay? But the math is the same, whether I'm doing two variables or 10 or 50 or 100 or 1,000. The math is the same if you convert it to linear algebra, fairly, fairly simple math. Um, and it's just a function of computational power then. But we have the computational power now. So I could, I could toss a thousand variables at this problem and correlate them all and get a prediction. It just wouldn't be a very good prediction. And the reason is that this particular approach is limited in that it weights everything equally. Okay, so the median income is weighted the same as the square footage, is weighted the same as the number of garages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we need, we need another way. And to do this, we're gonna use a technique that was developed as part of the research into artificial intelligence. This was inspired by the way the human brain works. And I say inspired because it's, you hear people say it's, it's based on human brains and it's called a neural network. And the, my problem with that is that it really sets up this thought process in your head that this is a brain. It, it's not, it's not that at all. Okay, so I'm gonna call these nodes. Each circle is a node. And I'm gonna describe for you how this, system, this set of, this way of looking at the data produces an output that is sometimes astonishing, 
in, in, its, uh, in its accuracy, okay? And this is the basis for all the machine learning systems that are in, in, that you see in use today. Every single one of them is using this basic principle we're about to go over. We have three things to talk about. One is the nodes. Each, each circle is a node. Now just stay with me now. These nodes are in layers, okay? The first layer, the layer of blue nodes, is called the input layer. This is where the data is going to go in. Okay, now, you know, remember now, we're not. This is not a traditionally programmed system with if-then-else logic. We're going to put data in, and we're going to get something out. And, the, and how we get it out is what we're going to go over now. That second layer is called the hidden layer. It's an intermediate layer. I think that's a better term, frankly. Intermediate layer. All right. And then there is the output, the output layer. This is, what, this is what comes out. So when I say, hey, fancy machine learning system, here is all of the data about sales prices, what's going to come out is my predicted price. Okay. For trading, what's going to come out is, should I do nothing, should I get long, or should I get short? Three choices. All right. The arrows are important, and they look confusing. So we're going to talk about the arrows. The arrows represent the weights between, or the relationships, I should say, between the different variables or the different features, as they're called in machine learning parlance. So if I've got 20 features, 20 variables that I want to correlate together about this particular topic, and I want to get some kind of output, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to give those to this this network. Now, what's going to happen is let's let's get rid of some of the arrows to make it a little bit easier to understand. Starting with this node at the upper left, this node has a copy of all of the data that we have. So for our housing prices, it would be all, all the housing sales. For trading, it would be all of the bars, okay? That node is going to send to each of the nodes in the next layer a version of that data with slightly different relationships between the data slightly different weights all of them slightly different and we're going to ultimately we're going to find out what is the best set of, of weights or relationships between this data in order to in order to produce an accurate output okay that's what we're going to do so in this case if i've got say 10,000 rows of data 10,000 sa uh, house, housing sales or 10,000 uh, bars of data from from trading I'm going to send those copies to the next node in the layer, each with slightly different weights. This is where some math gets applied. I promised no math, so no equations. But along that arrow, some math is getting applied that is related to correlating each of these variables to each other. Okay, And then each of the yellow nodes is going to apply some more math and send it out to the, the output layer, that little prediction node. It's going to collapse it all down, and what we're going to get out is a is a, a probability or a price. So for the for our housing example, we're going to get it. We're going to get a, a housing price. And for our trading example, we're going to get a probability that you should do nothing, get long, or get short. Okay. We're going to do this for every single one of these nodes. They're all going to do it simultaneously in parallel. Okay, to every node. So from blue to yellow to green. Now, when we do this, the, the machine's going to make this prediction using this math, which you don't really need to even know about it to understand intuitively what's happening. We are defining uh, weights between the variables. Okay, we actually ra uh, initialize them randomly. They're just random weights. Okay, we make a prediction. That prediction means take the data, shove it in the left side of my network, and what comes out the right is my prediction. And the key thing to understand here now is that for every row of data that I put in, I know what the actual, I know what the real answer is. I didn't give the network the real answer. I, you know, so in the case of our housing example, I just gave it the square footage and the median income of the sale of the of the purchaser and the number of garages and the zip code i just gave it that data i didn't give it the sales price it's got to predict that for trading it's the same thing i just give it all of my order flow data all of my fancy data that i i've got about trading 
but I don't tell it what actually happened. I don't tell it that the market went up from here or down from here or sideways. What comes out is this prediction. It's garbage at this point because it's, it's random. I compare that prediction to the actual result. Okay, how, how bad was, did I do? But keep in mind though, understand that it's not just one. You're, do, you're doing that for every single piece of data you have. Okay, and so of course the more data you have, the more uh, the, 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 the more accurate you're going to get in terms of how bad is my answer, okay? And what we want to know is how, how, how lousy did I do in this prediction? It's, it's, it seems a little, somewhat counterintuitive, all right? But this is what we're going to do. Show me how bad my prediction is. Calculate how bad the prediction is, all right? So if I have 10,000 rows and I got 1,000 right, well, that's 10%, that's 10 okay? It's it's 90% uh, wrong, okay? We calculate how bad the prediction is. And then, and here's the magic actually, here's the, play, here's the piece that's incredibly innovative. We adjust the weights based upon what we learn in terms of how bad that prediction is. Now this is the first time through, so we don't have much to work with. We adjust the weights and then we do it again. We now have a new set of weights, a new set of relationships between each of these nodes in the network. We make another prediction and we do it again. We calculate the result and then we see how bad it is. And then we adjust the weights again. All right, but we adjust the weights based upon did my prediction get better or worse than the previous time? So if it got better, then I adjust in that direction. If it got worse, I adjust in another direction. Now keep in mind, we're, it, it, it's not quite that simple, all right? There's not just one thing that you get to adjust either up or down. There's thousands actually of, of, of weights, of variables here. Remember there's 10,000 rows, there's maybe 20, 20 different variables for each one. Each of those has a weight that's get, that gets sent to the next node. So all of those weights, all, many, many thousands are getting adjusted here. And, and the, the piece of this that is absolute utter genius is happening right here because they are assigning responsibility for the badness of the prediction to each of the individual weights. Okay, and then we're gonna do this again, and 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 we're gonna keep doing it until we can't get the loss any lower, until we can't improve the prediction any better. Okay, so let's review. Make a prediction. Compare the prediction to the actual, and that's called the loss. In machine learning parlance, it's, this is the loss function. The loss is the thing we want to reduce. Adjust the weights and then make another prediction, which means just push it through the network again. Applying the math we've applied, but now using these new weights. Compare that prediction to the actuals, all right? And compare it to the previous run. Did I get better or worse? Adjust the weights to reduce the loss. That says improve the loss, that's really wrong. We want, we want to reduce the loss. We're, we're predicting, we're, we're actually calculating the badness of the result. How wrong are we? All right, and then do it again, and again, and again, and again. Hundreds and hundreds to thousands of times until you get the loss to a point where you can't make it any lower. You can't make your prediction any better, okay? Over and over and over again. Now, if you do, when you do that, this is an actual run from the system that I built. This is the, the graph of the loss. Starting at zero, along, if you go along the x-axis, that's the number of times through the network. You can see I started, it doesn't matter what the y-axis is, it has no meaning to, to us. We just want it to go down. And you can see it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. But overall, it's headed down and it's leveling off as we got to a thousand times through the network with all the data that I gave it. Okay. This is an example of what we call converging to a solution. Okay. So what, what's really going on here is that when you 
when you assign the weights this way between nodes like this, and then you adjust them until you can get to you, you improve the prediction. What's actually happening at an intuitive level is the system is identifying patterns in the data. And this is very similar to, how the, to what the brain does, the human brain. We're very, we're just as astonishing pattern recognition engines. Okay, and that's why we, it, it's certainly inspired by how the human brain works. Now this example here, this is very, very simple just for explanatory purposes. Make a prediction, calculate how good it was, adjust, adjust the relationships in the, in, the, in the direction of what you think is improvement, make another prediction and just keep doing that until you get it better and better and better, okay? If there is a cause and effect relationship between the data and the output, it will find a, a way to improve the loss. This is the way these work. All right, subject to a bunch of caveats in that you have the correct kind of network and lots of other things. But the point is, you you can you can give it random data and you won't get you won't converge to a solution because there's no patterns to find that are that are worthwhile. If I gave it wind speed and tried to predict, uh, you know, what time the sun would come up, it's not, not you're not going to get anything useful. Okay. Again, this is a very simple example. It, it's more like this actually, going deeper. So instead of just and data goes in in the blue in the blue uh, nodes in the input layer, and then to one of these intermediate layers, layers there's actually many many of these layers, which allow us to to make uh, increasingly refined weights, which which translates into an increasingly refined uh, understanding of the patterns of the data. Okay, this is called deep learning. As soon as you go from only one intermediate layer to many, and earlier we talked about one of the advances that had been made recently that's, that has been you know, a, a catalyst to the explosion in these systems that you're seeing what were advances in the software. It's right here. It was the ability to stack these intermediate layers side by side like this and get really deep that uh, allowed this to happen. All right, real networks, networks that are doing things like image recognition have hundreds of these layers, hundreds, okay? Um, and one of the things we do as machine learning uh, architecture designers is trying to understand, well, how deep do I need to go before I'm not, I'm not improving myself? Because it's just, you're just wasting um, computational power. Even this is, is very, very simple. It, this would probably be an even better example of kind of what's really going on because the actual number of nodes is in the hundreds, hundreds per row, okay? And then, you know, many, many layers deep to produce your output, okay? There's also lots of different kinds of these networks, okay? Let's, let's go back one step though. So when we're looking at this simple network, you can see what I mean when I say, this is not intelligent in any way. It's just doing some, it's just doing a little bit of, of math here. It's just doing, it, it's doing, a, it's doing it a lot of times. There's linear algebra being applied when we make the prediction and there's some uh, first year calculus being applied when we adjust the weights. I don't wanna, I don't wanna denigrate the accomplishment because the, what they've done here is just an incredible, uh, instance of human innovation, but it's not, we're not talking about super advanced mathematics here. It's the way it's applied that's, that, that makes it work so, so well, but it's just math. It's just like a complicated spreadsheet. There's no concept of, of intelligence in here at all. It's just a bunch, it's just a bunch of calculations, okay? Um, Lots of different kinds of networks to do different kinds of things. Now, this is important because as humans, as humans, we are able to run into a situation that's completely new to us and still figure out what to do. Machine learning systems cannot do that. If I have a machine learning system that's designed to recognize images, that's all I can do. It can't do anything else. It can't trade for me. If I have a machine learning system that, that makes trade decisions for me, it doesn't recognize images. 
It, it can't do fraud detection. It, it can't do speech recognition. It can only do one thing, and it can only do the one thing it was trained to do, and that's it, nothing else, okay? It's very, very restrictive. It doesn't mean it's not real powerful and not really useful. It's just not intelligent in any way. It's, it, it, it is a machine that is using a technique to learn from the data, okay? Now, this is why it's useful though, because we can focus it into an area and we can correlate many, many, many different variables simultaneously. And we can do lots of really interesting things. And once you have a trained model, you can do it very quickly, okay? And so for things like, uh, let's say you wanted to use machine learning to improve the control that you have over the processing equipment that you're using in your manufacturing facility. You can train a model to take the output from that, from that uh, machine and produce a prediction that it, it, you know, it is in control or, or some adjustment needs to be made to keep it uh, you know, in control or, or, to, produce, or produce, to produce the highest quality output that machine can produce. Okay, I know people that are, are doing this actually uh, today. Um, because we go deep, we can, we can create increasingly refined views of the data, okay? And most important, the thing that, is, that makes this so useful is that the more data you give it, the better it gets. So if you have created a good model, which is by no means easy, and if you've given it data that is appropriate to the problem, then as you add more data, the output of that, of that model will improve over time. That is the nature of the system. Uh, there's a couple questions here. Uh, Larry, we'll have to cover that later. Okay, let's see. Um, all right, so we're gonna walk through the, the process that you go through to create one of these things. This, is, this will help you see kind of what's involved. Um, in, in, just so you, also, so you understand what I'm doing specifically, which is coming next, but also to help you realize, look, these things aren't gonna wake up. There's a lot of work here that humans are doing to make this work, all right? So what we do is we start at the bottom with this orange box. We define a network architecture, and you saw there's many, many different kinds to solve many, many different kinds of problems. Okay, depending upon what you need to do. You've got uh, the our red box in the upper left is the data, which is incredibly important that you give it the right data and that you formatted it exactly perfectly. The, the, these systems are incredibly sensitive to the input data. Okay, that comprises our system. We then train it. We then, we then put it through that process you saw where we make a prediction, we calculate the loss, we adjust the weights, and we go around and around and around uh, until we produce until we cannot get that that loss any lower okay and at that point I have a model I'm in the middle here I'm in this this uh, green box now for a lot of cases you're you, you know at this point if you're in good shape or not so if I'm doing image recognition and I am trying to you know detect are there dogs or cats in these in these in these pictures and I give it a million pictures and I and I train a model on it and it tells me my accuracy is 98%, that means, okay, you're done, 98%, that's really good. For trading, that's not the case, okay? For trading, we don't know yet if the model you've created is useful. So you may have been able to converge to a solution, but how does it actually work when you're, when you're, when you're taking trades? And the reason that this is important is that we, don't, we wouldn't take every trade on every bar that's predicted. We'll take the first one, and everything that comes after that, you don't care about. And so it's possible that you've got a really high accuracy in your model, but that you consistently are getting a lousy prediction off the first, the first instance, which is the one you're always taking, okay? So what that means is, is that you, you have to go through this, this batch simulation process. So, what that essentially means is take my model and use it to predict what would happen if I took these trades. So here is my 
Here's my prediction that says get long. I just ignore any other predictions after that until I'm out of this trade. And then either you know follow the trade to that conclusion, whether it's a, it's a loss or it's a gain or whatever it happens to be, then take the next prediction. So you, you end up, because it's a time series problem, you don't end up using every single prediction that the system comes up with. And so you have to go through this process of batch simulation, where you, which you can then use to understand, okay, this model produces, you know, simulates at this level. All right, if I make changes to my model now, uh, if, or I make changes to my data, or I make changes to my network and I retrain my model, I can now run that same simulation and then compare those two values. Did I get better or worse? Kind of a larger version of the, the machine learning training that we talked about earlier. You're doing kind of the same thing, uh, uh, making uh, <clears throat> iterative changes to your system and then evaluating whether or not it improves. Now, this is, this is what, what step three here. You've got another key step to go through yet. So let's say you get to a point where, okay, I'm showing I've got a good model to help me make a trading decision and it simulates well. It's just a simulation. Simulation has nothing really to do with reality. All right, there could be bugs in your simulation program. It's past data. We don't know what will happen in the future. And it, it, it has no, there's no input into that process about the delays that occur in the real world. So now we got to go to real-time simulation. So real-time simulation is I take my, my model and I use it to predict trades to take, all right, in real time. Now we do simulation because it would be foolish to use real money because we don't know really if it, if it, how well it works or not, okay? So given the process that we're describing here, I actually, I actually went into real-time simulation three weeks ago. And, and spent two weeks working out issues that exist between uh, my, you know, my view of the world as in my batch simulation programs and the re in reality when you actually try to do this in real time. I also used that time to build the, the auto trading system that is part of Sierra Chart's functionality. Uh, Sierra Chart just continues to impress me with how uh, how powerful it is, though it, it, it remains difficult to learn. Okay, so uh, I'm in batch simulation. I'm doing real-time simulation. When, I, when, I'm, when I'm at a point where, okay, I have something that works, now it's time to go live. Okay, so for me, that was Monday. I went live on Monday. We'll be looking in a moment at some of, at some of those results. Um, this is a view of that batch simulation that we were talking about, all right? And what we need to know here is, well, okay, is this worth doing or not? Have you, have you spent all this time to no avail or, is it, or should you proceed? All right, so let's look up here. This is looking at the model that I created and the U contract for 2017, which is a period of time from June to uh, September, okay? Um, that's a profit number in ticks that's in simulation, 568 across that three month period. All right, um, this is a, the other key thing. How often did I hit a maximum loss day? So as traders, the most important thing we do is we manage our risk. That hasn't changed if I'm gonna use a machine learning system to help me trade. I still have to manage that risk. And that means I limit my losses every day and I limit my losses every week. Okay, so I have very strict rules that I use as, as a human trader and equally strict rules that I use uh, with a machine learning system. Okay, so in this case, it showed five days where you hit uh, a maximum loss for the U contract. This is simulation. Do not forget that. Some people see this number 568 ticks and they go, my God, I've never, I've never even gotten close to that. Gimme, gimme, gimme. But you got to remember, we're talking about a simulated result, so it's hypothetical. Um, and we're talking about the past. So we don't know what the future holds, which is why we manage our risk. It's why we have daily loss limits. It's why we have weekly loss limits. It's why we have uh, structures in place to protect us if something catastrophic goes wrong. Okay, one of the things we'll talk about is the need for a really good broker. Um, here is uh, the Z contract using this same model. 438 ticks, slightly less. Uh, less max loss days. There was actually less movement in that, that quarter, all right? 
That's that's a three month period of time when the Z the Z contract was the front month. Now here's H. H is interesting. Uh, also reminder simulation not real. Don't forget um, the H contract. The market started to get really volatile. Okay, big big profit numbers get. You, it's very easy to get very excited, uh, forgetting that it's not real yet. Uh, max loss days though ten, more than triple what you saw in simulation for the Z contract. A, a big deal for a lot of people. Okay, so with this in mind, let's move to real time simulation and see how we do. Work out those issues. And then with that in mind, move to live trading, which I did on Monday, okay? Now, we gotta talk about one other thing before we can get into specifically what I've done with that system. The, uh, how am I doing on time? All right, one of the advantages of machine learning is that when, as you give it more data, it gets better, okay? And this is particularly important in trading because you want to adapt to changing market conditions. So the more market conditions we see, the better and better and better our, our system is going to get, right? And so this is, this is the process that I go through every week after the close on Friday. I take the previous set of data that goes all the way back to the December of 2015, so it's two years and three months worth of data now. I add in last week's data and I retrain the system. I rerun the model. I get a new model and then I plug that in to the live trading system and we do that every weekend. So every Monday morning I'm, I'm running with the latest set of data. Uh, Ed, you're asking about curve fitting. I think you're. I think you're talking about it. The there is a, a dilemma that we have in machine learning called overfitting. So overfitting is a case where your your machine learning system has learned the data so well that it's basically memorized it. All right, which makes makes it really good for looking for do for producing a simulation but lousy for working on uh, new data that it's never seen. Uh, part of the process is you, you train on a subset of your data and then you validate on a different set, a set of the data this machine has never seen. I didn't, I didn't show that chart, okay? So it, this is a very well understood problem in machine learning. It's something that we're very cognizant of that you, your, your model needs to generalize to new data, okay? And so we work very hard to make sure that happens, all right? It's very easy, actually, the systems are so powerful now, it's pretty easy to overfit it, okay? So that it's, it perfectly knows the old data, but won't necessarily work well on the new data, okay? I don't do anything like, like news events and things like that, no. I'm just looking at the order flow data. Okay, uh, where are we? All right, real quick. Now, architecturally speaking, there's three pieces involved here. There's a custom study inside Sierra chart that I've written that gets the data I need and sends it out. Where it sends it is to a machine learning system that is a server that's sitting on my computer, okay? That system receives the data. It does some work on it to prep the data for prediction. And then it makes a prediction and then it sends the action back. Okay, that action is uh, captured by that same uh, custom study. And then Sierra Charts spreadsheet study kicks in and does whatever you've told it to do. Okay. Um, Let's go look now at what that looks like in, C in Sierra chart. Uh, Alan's asking why not go back to 2000 with more data. I just don't have access to good data from that time. Okay. Um, here's today's result, uh, plus 165. These daily videos are out on the, uh, on the YouTube channel, so you can see those if you like. Um, the, you can subscribe to them also off my site. And so when they get uploaded, you can you can watch them 
pretty interesting stuff right now as I'm, I'm doing lots of commentary in addition to into watching uh, what it's doing. Um, so here's today, all right? The, the, the study is right there. TRT stands for the Rational Trader. ML predict that's sending the data. Going, it goes out to a server. The server is here. All right, in fact, here, let me start the server so you can actually see something. I mean, it, there's not a whole lot to actually show. So to start the server, this will start up and you'll see it load the models. Um, what we're doing here is we are not predicting on every bar. Or rather, we're not predicting to do to, to take an action on every bar. That It turns out to be uh, pretty foolish, actually, to try to do that. What we are doing is identifying different behaviors in the market, and then we're modeling those behaviors. So the specific behaviors here are the market is trying to turn, or the market is pulling back or retracing. So pulling back would be a long, retracing would be a short. Uh, so there the server started up, wasn't that exciting? Um, and if we look here, we'll see, the, let's see, the, this green line is when the index opens. I don't trade the first five minutes. I let that volatility settle down. Uh, the yellow line here, the yellow circle here is a place where you see, you can, you may have trouble seeing it because it's a dark blue. A 102 is a long signal, but I didn't take that, or rather the system did not take that trade, which is unfortunate because that would have been a nice trade. And the reason it didn't do it is because we, I have it tuned pretty tightly to, to, to stay out of noise. Um, given the recent just really wacky volatility we're dealing with. Now, one thing that's worth talking about before we continue here is um, when the markets get really volatile, what I do as a human trader is I completely stand aside. It's too crazy. You do, all you do is get, is get destroyed. And I was expecting to do the same thing with... Um, the auto trading system with my machine learning auto trading system. I was expecting to look at the market, decide that it's too volatile, and then just not turn it on that day. But what I saw in in not in simulation, but in replay, and then in in real time simulation, what I saw was that not only the machine learning system can certainly react quick enough to uh, execute the trade. Um, and the underlying order flow data is still appropriate. It still works, it's still, you still get decent predictions, okay? Um, and so I changed my mind. I decided that I'm willing to do it. The problem is that because it's more volatile, you're gonna take more losses. You're gonna, I mean, that's the nature of volatility is it's the, the unpredictability is higher. But I'm willing to do that because that volatility represents opportunity. And what I saw in replay was, while I did see more times when I took a max loss, I saw quite a few times where I, I did, I made a very nice gain, okay? And this is a case where the machine learning system has taught me a few things. And one of the things is that what I do as a trader when conditions are good, when I get up, I tend to back off. The machine doesn't do that. It just keeps, it just keeps trading when it sees good trades or when it, see, when, when it sees predictions that it thinks are good. And so you end up doing quite a bit better, um, at least in replay. Uh, here we see some chop through here to this today. This is the NASDAQ, All right? So the, the system is not gonna take that. Now, as a human, we can very clearly see that looks choppy. That first one I've circled in yellow is important because I think that's a trade we should be taking. Uh, so I, I gotta, I've got some work to do there to improve that. Uh, the system says get get long here and it scratches. I, I'm using a very tightly controlled stop trail. I, it gets up 10 ticks and it moves the stop to entry plus one. In part, I, I would never trail no, that aggressively normally, but with the machine learning system, I'm being pretty conservative. Uh, it's so, Thus far, it's actually working out okay. There's a short there that also scratches. It gets short. It sees this little pullback here and then gets short. Um, gets its 10 ticks and, and, and scratches out. I'm trading just a single contract. I'm taking uh, $50, 50 of risk per trade, 10, 10 ticks. More chop, so don't do anything, stay out of the chop. So we're, I'm succeeding there and staying out of the chop. 
Uh, here it tries to, it doesn't try, it gets short there. I lo actually love this signal. This is another thing that the, uh, the machine learning system taught me. If you look at what's happening here, the market is advancing and then it pulls back and then it advances. All right, so I would be looking to get long there. All right, when I see a, a pullback, I'm thinking long, but what the machine learning system showed me is that look, it doesn't, I didn't tell it get long on pullbacks. I just told it, here's the data. And here's what happened for each bar. And it came up and, and what, you, what you discover is that fully 40 to 50% of the time, those pullbacks fail and you wanna be going the other way. What the data shows is that 50% of the time, you don't wanna do anything. And of the remainder, um, 50, a little bit more than half, 55% of the time, the market is continuing in the direction of that pullback or retracement and the others, it's failing. So I love this because you're getting short on, a, on an up bar. You get a great entry, you get to scratch very quickly, and then if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, more chop. Here's another case where my, my caution on staying out of the noise is hurting me. All right, so that's clearly not choppy to me. That's clearly a case where you know, I, I, I can take that trade. That code, just to read these codes, if it starts with a one, it means a long. If it starts with a two, it means a short. Um, if you're interested in the, in the details, more details than we have time for today, there will be a tutorial and an overview on Saturday that you're, you're welcome to join. It's free to give you some more information about how this works. Up here, uh, we get short. Um, right there is the prediction. You can see that turn. We're modeling the, the, the turning behaviors being modeled here, not the pullback or the uh, retracement behavior. So there's actually, I, I don't think I was clear about that. There's three models that are running here. There's a model that's looking at, at the turns and a different model that's looking at pullbacks long and, a, and another model that's looking at pullbacks short. If you're interested, it's much easier to find a solution for turns than it is for pullbacks. And of the pullbacks, the longs are cleaner than the shorts. Interesting stuff that I've learned. Um, so that you know that gets short here. I'm using a hard target of 30 ticks, which it gets right there, um, and then it's done. Uh, another case here in yellow, where I'm I'm letting I'm a little too little too cautious on trying to stay out of noise. Both of these cases, as a human, I look at these and go, that's not noisy. I should I should be taking that trade. Same thing here. This one here, the yellow one, that's a trade I should be taking. These here, I agree. I want to stay out. Okay, so we're going to talk about this in a minute, why, why the, that this is particularly important uh, given the technology that we're working with. Let me get back to my presentation. And we need to start winding up here because we're running out of time. From current slide. Okay, so... CR chart grabs the data, it sends it out to a server, the server does the processing and then it sends it back to uh, CR chart, which does all the work in terms of managing the trade, okay? So the piece that I've built here is, this, is, the, is on the left, the machine learning system itself and then the custom study that gives it the data that it needs to do its work. Um, we talked about how it's finding behaviors in the market, okay? So I'm, I'm currently looking at turns and pullbacks other obvious choices are breakouts, all right, which I have not modeled at this point. Even among turns and pullbacks, there is a, there is a spectrum that exists between being conservative and being, and being aggressive. Those batch simulation results I showed you earlier were sort of in the yellow area of this of this uh, spectrum. They were moderately aggressive, um, too aggressive, and you it it simulates at higher profitability, but you end up getting whacked more often and get, taking yourself out of the market uh, too soon. So one of the problems that we see with something like those batch simulation programs, they're really useful to help us understand is my model effective, but they're terrible at helping you understand what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? So it's something to keep in mind. I've learned a lot since I went to real-time simulation in areas that, I, that, uh, that are ripe for improvement. Um, the question now is, why would you want to use machine learning for trading? Okay. 
it's not magic. Hopefully you understand now that it's not intelligent. It's not artificial intelligence. There is no th such thing as artificial intelligence, and it's, this is certainly not, not intelligent. What it is is a very sophisticated mechanism for identifying patterns. And that's what we do as traders. And so this was my epiphany was let's let's use this pattern recognition cap capability in, in the service of finding good entries for, for trading, okay? It isn't magic. Don't expect it to behave magically. It won't, okay? It's just another tool. It's like you're a carpenter who's been using a hammer and a nail, and now suddenly somebody's given you uh, a compressed air nail gun. You're still a carpenter. You just have a better tool. Okay, so as a trader, what that means is you still have to manage your risk because you, you cannot escape. You can't escape the randomness of the environment. I know many of you heard artificial intelligence and trading and you thought, yes, I'm going to do that and I'm never going to take a loss. It's emphatically not the case. The markets are very random. There's a large random element in trading. That it, a better term is a nonlinear and dynamic system. That's what the trade, that's what that's what the markets are. They're sensitive to the inputs and there's thousands upon thousands of inputs. So at any given time, it behaves in an essentially random way. And what we're doing is we're looking for those places where the market is doing something that we have seen before where we believe it has a higher probability of doing one thing over another. We limit our risk in case we're wrong and we try not to limit our upside so that we are, our risk to reward ratio makes it worth our while, okay? You cannot evaluate something like this on a case-by-case -case basis. You have to evaluate it larger. My, the baseball team that I follow, to give you an example, lost over 50 games last season, 50. I mean, clearly they suck. 50 games is terrible. How could you lose 50 games and be any good? And yet, you know, I grew up in Southern California, so my team's the Los Angeles Dodgers, who had a, just about had a season for the ages, went to the World Series and lost to the Houston Astros, who lost even more games during the regular season. Okay? We don't evaluate a baseball team on the results of one game. We evaluate it on the results of the season. It's the same reason that batch simulation is useful, because I can see over time that if I apply these rules, this is what I can achieve, okay? But not on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? With the caveat that it's simulation, so it doesn't have any of the real-time issues associated with it, and it's past. We don't know what will happen in the future. Uh, another example is a poker player. If he's dealt a bad hand and folds and loses his table stake, is he a bad player? You would never say that. He's a good player. And yet that's kind of how people act. When you, you take a trade and it fails, you go, okay, I was wrong. I'm a bad trader. Or a system takes a trade that was wrong or that was wrong or that loses money. Okay, it's a bad system. You have to evaluate it over a larger period of time because of the random element that exists in the markets. Okay, so instead of saying what we had earlier on our chalkboard, this is the reason here to use machine learning is it enables you to execute consistently. Because if you hand over, if you hand over the decision making to something that has no human emotion in, involved in it, but is still doing a sophisticated pattern recognition, then you're in much better shape. So here's a summary. It completely removes the human emotion from trading decisions. Okay, I've been doing this live since Monday. I can't, I'm a changed man. I can't tell you how relaxing it is to trade. I, I don't have to do anything now. I sit there and I, I talk to the members and we talk about how the machine learning system is working and what is it doing and where, where are the areas to improve and, and you know, what are the plans and why is it doing what it's doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so there's no human emotion at all. And the other thing to think about that's very key, so when you're trading, 
you're providing input to your emotional machinery on a second by second basis. You get into a trade and you're just, the market's up a tick and you're joyful and it's down a tick and you're anxious and fearful. Up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And that can really, it can just turn you into a, a complete basket case or a bundle of nerves. It's even the same when you're pulling the trigger. Should I take this trade? Should I not? Should I get long? Should I get short? Should I, should I, should I, should I, should I? That's gone. It's completely gone. I'm not, I don't, I, I did not make any decisions at all this week except to turn the system on in the morning and a larger decision on the weekend about how aggressive I wanted to be along my aggressive conservative spectrum. Okay. Reason number one. Reason number two. It is a very well defined, very structured process that we have in place that adapts to the market. Okay. It adapts because, it adapts because I needed to stop doing this. Uh, it adapts because we give it new data every week. We resupply the data every week and rerun and recreate the model. Someone's going to ask, why don't you do it every day? It's because it takes longer than a day to create the model. Um, for me, this is the most sophisticated mechanism to make an automated trading decision that I've ever seen. And understanding that the underlying technology is identifying patterns and recognizing that that's what we're doing as traders. When you put those two together, it's th there's a lot of synergy there, okay? Um, it can run in a completely unattended fashion. There are some caveats there. In particular, you need, to, you need a good broker. Um, you need a broker like Infinity, actually, who will pick up the phone when you call them, but, but at least as important, has uh, a feature that implements uh, what, what Infinity calls a daily risk limit. If you have a daily risk limit, what that means is if, you're, if your account gets below a certain, if you lose more than X amount that you've defined, they'll flatten you. And you need that in case something catastrophic happens. You're not using that as a stop loss or anything like that. Your automated trading system is doing that. But something catastrophic could happen. Like you could completely lose your network connection and now, okay, you're gonna need, you need, you need a safety net there. There are people who cannot attend the sessions when the high probability times are, which is the first two hours, the first two and a half hours. You, you now have the ability to run it, in my opinion. All right, you can run the system, you can turn it on and walk away. That's what I do every day now, the last four days. I, I'm in the room until 7.30 and then I, I, I step away. I come back when I'm done, it trades by itself for the next hour and a half. It actually traded by itself for the first hour. I didn't do anything, I just watched it. And then the third thing, which I think is the most important and touches upon uh, the yellow circles we looked at earlier, where I saw cases where I think that's a trade I should be taking. It's only gonna get better. The mechanism that's in place is a foundation and the, just the nature of technology innovation is that it improves incrementally. And then it, you, we also tend to make step function increases, but it will just improve and improve and improve. If you remember um, like Google Maps, when it first came out, it was just a online version of my Thomas Brothers map book, but it became better and better and better. They added, it, 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 now it was on your phone. They added uh, di directions or route calculation. They added congestion information for traffic. They added, uh, they improved the route, the, the directions based upon the, conge the congestion and the predicted congestion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just get better and better and better. And that's what's, that's what's gonna happen here. I can already see it. I already have uh, lots of ideas about what to do next. I'm very, very excited about uh, what the future holds here. There's a bunch of questions. I'm going to get to them. I'm sorry. Um, what's coming up next is the model for the ES is in process. It's a little bit harder with four ticks per point. It's, the fills are more interesting. The fills are a more difficult issue. I want to do a currency, which is probably euro, and then a commodity, which is probably CL, since I'm an old oil trader. So you know, the data is a little bit more tricky just because there's so many contracts. Um, the other thing definitely on the horizon is, is modeling breakouts. So I, I in particular want the case where you were modeling a turn or a pullback and then 
there's a level that's been set by the market and then you you know you've entered the market on that pullback of that turn and then you you also break through that level i want a prediction right there if that's going to succeed or not i want to add to that position so this is these are things in my head that i'm planning um let's see availability so i am trading this live right now every day you can watch the daily video subscribe to them there i, I I'm, I'm fascinated by this, but I might be biased. Um, they're 10 to 20 minutes long right now, so they're a little long, but uh, there's lots of extra commentary about machine learning in them. I encourage you to take a look at them. Um, it's not available for your average user yet. I just don't have the installation programs, uh, which are a little bit trickier because there's a server sitting on your computer. It's not, it's not as easy as uh, just a Sierra chart custom study. Um, it's very difficult for me to determine pricing because I don't have that much live data. And it would be very difficult for you to evaluate cost uh, without more live data. All right. So I right now, daily videos are going out with the results. I'll be posting the statements. The account that I'm using is only for this. So it, it's very easy to track the, the efficacy of the system, how, how good it works. Ultimately, what what will happen is there, there will be a like a, a big upfront fee for it for the system okay it's too valuable to just to, to just give away like i uh, well that's not fair what i do today is for i teach people how to trade all right what this is doing is it's basically doing the trading for you um all of the work that you have to do as a trader in terms of reprogramming your own physiological response to risk, all of the work you have to do to overcome fear, anxiety, doubt, excitement, greed, euphoria, all of that's gone. So I've obsoleted my service because that's really what I do. I teach people how to deal with that, okay? Now all you have to do, you have to turn the system on in the morning and you have to manage your risk. There are very strict risk management rules. Um, and really, when you, when you think about risk management, here's how I do, I've done it in the past for humans. If you're down two trades on the day, stop. You're, either, you're not reading the market correctly or, or your method is out of sync with the market. And if you're down two days out of the week, stop for the week because for the same reason. You're not reading the market well or you're out of sync. With the machine learning system, I've modified those rules in part because it takes a lot more trades. Um, and But it's the same idea, X, X amount per day, and you define that in, in the spreadsheet study. And then X amount per week, you have to manage that. Okay, I can't, there's no weekly P&L that I can, I can access in the spreadsheet study. Okay, with machine learning, it's more interesting though, because if you're down for the week at a point where you're gonna stop, so you've taken two max loss days or three max loss days, whatever you've decided, that weekend, we're gonna take that week's data and stick it into the model and retrain it. And, it, and, and you're gonna start Monday morning with a model that has last week's data in it. And this is, I think, is, is pretty interesting relative to how humans approach it, okay? We're doing the same thing. We're just giving it more data. And so when we restart on, on the, the following Monday, we now have last week's data in the system and it, it, it is now part of the predicting process. So ultimately, this is a long way to get to, I don't know what to charge, okay? And so, but there's going to be a large upfront fee in the thousands of dollars, okay? Um, I don't restrict markets. I don't, you don't have to pay more if you want to do this market or that market. You know, you just, you, you have to, if I'm, if I'm producing models for that market, you, you, you can use it. All right. Um, what I'm doing right now today is if you're interested, then you can sign up now and you won't have to pay that, that upfront fee. All right. You, you're taking a risk though, because you don't have as much data to evaluate if it's worth that. Okay, so if you sign up, you know, the, I'm, I'm, I'm only gonna take 30 people because I, between my members plus 30 more, that's all I think I can support here as, as we get going. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about making sure I can get everybody installed correctly. All right, so for the first 30 people, no upfront fee, $195, we'll reserve that spot. You won't 
that's a monthly fee that you then have to pay to get new models, okay? That's an important thing to understand. Um, you won't, we won't start, the clock won't start ticking on the next month until you actually have software in hand. So the, whatever you're paying now is to reserve the spot and it's for the first month, okay? That is all I have for today. Uh, there's a very interesting quote on screen from Charles Darwin, which is something to think about. I've been thinking about a, lo a lot as I've been dealing with the concept of adapting to changing market conditions. And now let me look at questions. Shane, real quick, did you want to talk about the Saturday thing? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Patrick. So on Saturday, I, I'm giving, there's a free tutorial I'm doing for an hour and 90 minutes that is um, an overview and a, and like a tutorial on how to use the system. So everyone's invited, whether you sign up or not, but what, we're gonna go into a lot more detail into exactly how the system decides um, what's happening in the market, how those models work, and, in, and it, in uh, much more uh, nuts and bolts, how do I how do I work the system? How do I turn on automated trading? How does the spreadsheet study work? What are what are the what are the options that I have? If I want to be conservative, what do I do? If I want to be aggressive, what do I do? How do I set my daily loss limit? Things like that. Okay, so the actual practical daily use of the system. Uh, Bob, go on. Can we post the link? Yeah, right there. So the link just posted, Bob. You can just sign up there. Or go to the homepage for rationaltrader.com and the, the top link is, will take you to the sign up. Uh, do I have a machine learning book to recommend? Ooh. Uh, that's a pretty broad field, Al. Let me think about that. Send me an email to remind me to try to answer you. Uh, it is recorded. Yes, Richard, no worries. Um, so Glenn, go to the homepage or click the link that Patrick just posted. Go to the homepage, click the top link. You'll see it says sign up and all that stuff. Um, I posted the Saturday link and I also posted the, the if, if someone wants to sign up, you know, for the first 30 thing you mentioned. Hey, Tim, the, uh, I, I'm sorry, Patrick. I have a, hey, okay. Tim, if you have a lifetime, mem if you have a lifetime license to the Rational Trader, uh, you'll get that study. OK, you won't get updated models without a subscription, but you're if you're a lifetime member, your old rate still applies. You're not paying the new rate. Something else for new people, you, your rates never going to go up ever. All right. So, Tim, you were paying ninety five a month. You'll get to keep paying that if you if, 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 if you sign up and you want to do this. OK. My existing trading indicators and website will still be available. I just will not be actively teaching them. Um, I think I just answered Randy's question as well. Uh, you know, bonds I'm interested in, Robert, but I haven't, I haven't actually attempted to model them yet, so I don't know what they look like. All right, so the current plans, NQ is live. Yes, I'm trying to make next, and then Euro or CL. CL's gotten interesting again recently, so maybe CL next. Uh, can it be used to scalp the notes? I have no idea, Mitchell. Uh, I'm going up the questions here, so please be patient. I, I appreciate your uh, your time today. Uh, Mercado is talking about basically what skills does it take to do this? Uh, admittedly, I have a very unique set of skills all right, I have a computer science background and I've been trading for years. So I've got the domain knowledge and I've got the programming skill. Um, it took me a year and I, and I know what I'm doing. Okay, so I'm not trying to, to uh, um, discourage you. If you'd like to know where to start in machine learning, send me an email, I'll tell you exactly where to go. All right, it's a fascinating field. It's, it's, it's been, quite the journey. And even now here, I, I want to explain something very quickly, if you don't mind. Um, I've had this idea in my head that I've been working towards for a long time, hundreds and hundreds of hours of work. 
and my goal is I want a system that I can turn on and walk away. And I started that Monday and I did not make a single trading decision this week. It was the, it was the easiest trading I've ever done. Uh, it was complete. There's no, you know, as, as even, even after you've been trading for a while, there's lots of emotion involved in, 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 in trading. Lots of excitement, lots of fear, anxiety. None of that's there. It's gone. Right, you can just walk away. I come back at the end of the day. I'm up or I'm down. Okay, that's one emotional input to my machinery. I'm sorry, that's one input to my emotional machinery. It was wonderful. I'm so pleased at how well it's come together. I have a lot to do. There's a lot of innovation and improvement to be done. This is, the, but I feel like I have a very solid foundation laid. I'm really pleased. And when you, the other thing to consider is the, the market conditions right now are absolutely wacky. And yet it's, I'm still doing okay, all right? I was, you know, the, 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 the conditions are really weird. The wheels fell off the bus at the beginning of February. Uh, how long does the machine take to unlearn bad behavior when market behavior changes in some fundamental way? Boy, Daniel, I love this question. Uh, one week, because it's gonna get retrained uh, the following the following weekend, okay? When might this system be available? Phil, you can sign up now, okay? It'll be a couple weeks before you have software on your system. Uh, I'm only taking the first 30 people, so I won't start charging you for that second month until you actually have something in your hand, all right? So don't worry about that. Tim, what is the win-loss ratio? We don't know yet, that's the problem. Or Tom, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't have good data for you that is meaningful, okay? Um, it, because it has to be live, all right? So the daily videos are up, go watch them and you'll see what's happening, okay? I will be posting the statements from, from that account. It, the way I view this, this is very much a journey that we're now all on and if you, if you sign up, we're on it together. Um, if you're if you're not comfortable because it's too early, I, I respect that. Come back in a couple months. Um, how long does it take from Sierra to ML back to Sierra? It's sub millisecond, Larry. It's so fast. I actually, Larry, I'm going to tell you something. I actually put the server, the, the machine learning server, on a computer in New York, and I'm in California, and I sent the message out and back and I got it in 84 milliseconds all the way across the country and back. So in the, in the computer system, it's so fast that it's essentially instantaneous. I have not tried smaller range bars, Mike, but you're not prevented from trying that. All right, part of the training is, okay, well, what if I wanna use a different chart or a different timer? That's fine, you can do all that. You need, you need, to, you need to run that in replay. You need to simulate that to make sure that it works or doesn't work, all right? But the data is the same. All right, because it's about relationships between the data. Uh, I cannot show notes. I don't do notes. Okay, so Randy's got a great point. He's talking about basically the, the how much do you weight the short, the most recent data with the older data? And this is actually a... a something I've been thinking about. So in other words, recent market behavior, the theory is or in, in implied in the question is that recent market behavior has more weight than older market behavior. Um, I'm not doing anything specifically to uh, pro give more weight to older or newer data, okay? What I see, uh, Randy, is when you saw me run that batch simulation, or you saw those batch simulations for the three contracts, I've run that for all of them. When you do machine learning, one of the things you do is you, you, you segment the data, it's called cross-validation. You segment the data into a bunch of parts. So if I have like five parts, I pick four of them, train on that and test on the fifth. Then I pick a different four, train on that and test on the, on the fifth. And, you, and this is the way you make sure that your model is generalized. Okay, so I've done that, so I don't see the need to weight more recent market behavior more than older market behavior. I actually just want to see all of it and let the system uh, identify 
the, the patterns of behavior it's seeing in the market. Um, Though it's a very interesting question, and it would be, if I had more time, that would be something worth researching. Uh, let's see. Hey, Gerard. Um, the trading data from, so we take the trading data from this week, like tomorrow at the end of market close tomorrow, I'll take all of the data for this week and I'll add it to my, the, the existing set of data I have and I'll retrain the system from scratch. All right, that's, that's what happens every week. I don't do anything else related to like news events, nothing super fancy like you might be thinking. We're looking at order flow data, all right? It's in fact, the old, people are asking about the old tutorials and things like that. They're still there on my site. You can still go watch them. In fact, I highly recommend it. You'll learn more about the market. That's the view of the order flow that I'm using. I have implemented the rational trader's view of trading in a machine learning system. That's what I've done, okay? So I, I, I've had to supplement that with some additional order flow data in order to make it work, stuff I don't use as a human, but that's what I've done. So if you, if you, if you wanna sort of kind of get a feel for why it's making a prediction where it's making it and why it's, you, you can look at the, the tutorials that I that I I have produced in the past, and you'll get a sense for what's going on there. Uh, I think I'm out of questions now. I think unless there's been a bunch of new ones at the bottom. Uh, what should your account size be to start with this new system, Rob? Call Patrick. Okay, you have to assess your risk to capital. Okay, I am modeling it on. A $5,000 account taking $50 of risk per trade, I will allow uh, a $155 loss per day and I'll allow three losses per week. That's really aggressive, okay? That's what I'm doing. I mean, I'm running that live right now, okay? But that may not be appropriate for you. I'm not the right person to ask that, that question. You need to talk to, call, call Patrick and talk to him. They, those guys know how to, how, how, how to help, you, help you through that decision. Jan, if you can, if you if you are on the page that lets you push the button, then you are within the thirty. Yes, it, the page will come down after thirty. Physically, Chris, it uh, there is a okay. Let's go out and look at it. Hold on, Patrick. As long as it's okay, I've got more questions. Physically, Chris, there is a custom study here. Okay, that sends information to a server that is sitting on your computer, that is, where did it go? Uh, did I, there it is, right there, which then sends it back. That's what it is. And then the spreadsheet system that Sierra Chart has created um, takes over and issues the actual trades to the trade service, okay? There is no prediction on return per 5K investment per month, no, okay? We can't do that. We don't know what that is, all right? All we can do is look at past data and understand how it works and manage our risk because the future is fundamentally unknown. Does it trade better than you did live? Yes, Tom, it does. It's better than me, I'm sad to say, or I'm happy to say, I'm actually not sure. Um, here's, how, here's the difference, Tom. I do better when the market conditions are ugly. I do better than my machine learning system. But when my market conditions are good, it destroys me. So what happens with me is that I'll get up, the market will be moving strongly, and I'll, I'll relax and back off. The system won't. The system, it just, it just keeps taking the trade. If, that's a, if, if, that, if it sees that pattern for that pullback, then it's gonna take the trade. I'll go, that's, I don't wanna chase the market, that's too aggressive. The machine, I just told the machine, you're only allowed to do pullbacks that are moderately aggressive, but otherwise go to town. And in that respect, it beats me every time. Uh, you can cancel at any time, Floyd. There's no contracts. There never has been with me. Uh, Kathy, what I want you to do is go watch the daily videos to answer your question. Start with today or start with Tuesday. Lots of very interesting discussion about what happened on those days, okay?
about and, and how machine learning is, is interacting with the market. Uh, switch to a different browser, Larry, or uh, Chris, I don't understand your question. Where on your website are your videos? If they're actually on YouTube, David, go to, inform here, uh, let me show you. Go to Information for Success and go to Daily Videos. Uh, I lost my browser. Here, go here, uh, look on my screen and just click that link, Daily Videos. And it will take you to the YouTube page that has the data videos. I switched all my videos to YouTube because never it doesn't matter. <laughs> the server was getting too expensive. Uh, so Larry, if you continue to struggle, let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. Change to a different browser might be your answer. Uh, how many live streams, Kathy? I told you that. Uh, are we reserved a spot or do we as current members need to do no Davey if you're a current member you're you're taken care of you especially are taken care of can we trade two accounts I'm thinking about yes, we can. no 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 I, yes you can trade two accounts for with from from a Patrick's perspective from my perspective, how does that work? We would do an allocation system. So you'd actually be placing one trade and the bills would get broken down into each account at the end of the day. Just like- Oh, really? Do for, yeah. Oh, that's very cool. I had no idea. I'm sorry, Patrick. You trade, yeah, you could trade, you know, you, we would create an allocation account, which is like a fictitious account number that you just use for logging in. And then let's say there's two accounts and you want to do one lot in each one, you would just trade two lots in the allocation. And then at the end of the day, we would break the bills down on a one-to-one -one ratio for each account. So that's, uh -huh. that, that would be the thing. Yeah, you learn something new every day. That's awesome, Patrick. I didn't know that. Pretty cool. Uh, okay, uh, let me see. Last, last questions here. Um, hey, Larry. It's good to see you again. Uh, Rob, where do we sign up? There's a link in there somewhere, or just go to the homepage. And the, the very top link, you can't miss it. It's the first link there. I lost my browser again. Browser, 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 browser. Right there. Click here to sign up for the introductory raid. Um, Robert, if you're a lifetime member, you're, you're taken care of, don't worry. No upfront fee for you, no increase in rate. You just have to, you just have to start paying your, your old rate again. Are you able to turn the system on and off? Yes. Very important question. This is Sierra chart functionality. You just go up here and you say trade, auto trading enabled, and you just turn that off. In fact, you, one of the things we, we do in trading is in training is tell you to make sure that you, you have it set to automatically disable on startup. So you have to physically choose to start it. You don't want it to start auto trading on you as your... Um, when you're just starting up your system to look at the charts. Saturday time is 2 o'clock Pacific, 5 o'clock Eastern. It'll be recorded, Walter. Where are the stops held on my PC or the remote servers? So, okay, so basically, where are the attached orders? Patrick, you want to answer this question? This came up. Oh, uh, sure, yeah. So the, the orders themselves reside at the exchange level, the logic that holds them together is held with your connection. So you do want to stay connected. Um, Sierra does a pretty good job though of reconnecting if internet connections are lost. So if you, and you can test this for yourself, put Sierra up, shut off your internet connection, you'll see Sierra disconnect, and then turn your internet connection back on and you should see Sierra automatically reconnect. So it does a pretty good job if you do have a broken connection. but. The orders themselves are held at the exchange. Attached orders, like brackets, the orders themselves reside at the exchange. The logic that ties them together is held with your connection. Would you use a VPN? Um, Chris, it's simply a function of the speed with which you are able to communicate to the, the broker. All right. 
I don't use a VPN here. My VPNs are, are fast enough, I believe. I haven't tested it though. You'd have to test that. Uh, Sean, were you, are you, did you, are you a lifetime member or just a member from some time in the past? If you're a lifetime member, your old rate is grandfather, just call me and we'll set, or send me an email and we'll set you up. If you're not lifetime, then you're, uh, you have to, you have to do the new rate. Uh, probably you're okay then. Just send me an email and we'll, and we'll get you set up. You went to my, uh, Robert, you should uh, refresh the page because I believe we're still accepting. If that says click here, yeah, no, it's, it's fine. If you can get to here, yeah, you might be cached. You might have a cached page from before. Any other questions here? Um, what variables can I control? Stuart, a lot. So come to Saturday's session and we'll go over that. You have a lot of control, a lot. You don't have to do, execute any of that control, but you can do a lot. Um, and, and sort of understanding that is kind of important as you move on. A lifetime member, Robert, was um, under the old regime. If you, the way, I, the way my service was structured, you just paid $95 a month. You didn't have to pay a large upfront fee for all of the custom studies that I use. Um, and, but if you were with me for 12 months, then everything became lifetime. The studies became lifetime, so that's not the case anymore. Um, by signing up today, are we a member of your organ? I don't know what that means. Yes, it's still available, Robert, yes. And we need to wrap up now. Uh, Patrick, thank you for letting me go long, I'm sorry. Uh, it is still available, Robert. If you're having trouble, send me an email. You're taken care of because I'm looking at your, your request right here, don't worry. Yes, if you sign up today, you're a member. You, you have access to everything that exists today to, to current members. I just haven't released this, this machine learning system yet. All right, we're a couple weeks out. Thank you everybody for attending. I appreciate your time. Sorry we went long, and I look forward to. to I'll see you on Saturday, many of you. Um, we'll send. I'll send out invitations as well. And um, good luck. Take care.